prescribing course um, probably about was it a year and a half ago? No, I did my non-medical prescribing in 2017. So it's, it's just a bit more than a year now. Okay. I think we are now live on YouTube, which is great. And we are streaming live on LinkedIn. Right, we have three participants. Uh, let's have a look who we can speak to. Uh, good evening, Jonathan. Can I confirm that you can hear me? It says talking permitted. Yeah, I can, yeah. Oh, per perfect. Thank you. Great. Brilliant. Good stuff. Right. Right, we will be starting in literally five minutes and I'm just gonna sort my slides out. But I'm joined today by one of my, you know, not, not only a business partner, my elder brother, but also someone who has been very inspirational. So Basim, it's a pleasure to have you here today. I know it's kind of a kind of last minute that I've thrown this on you, but it's always fun to have family around. Uh, when it comes to these sort of events. So as Fahim was, uh, has a lot of time on his hands at the moment, and he's left me to uh, deal with uh, the uh, pharmacies at the moment. So uh, my day has been composed of running around, chasing stock that's unavailable, um, looking for alternatives, and more importantly, uh, <laughs> dealing with the rise in drug prices. Uh, and it's something I will be talking about in more detail, hopefully on Monday with um, another friend of ours, Michael Paul. Yeah. Uh, but just to, uh, whilst Fahim is waiting, so just to give you an example of the day today, uh, I know we're in an extra, extraordinary situation <clears throat> with the virus, um, but, you know, it's, it's uh, I, I'm just surprised at, uh, you know, how pharmacies are in the front line, but how, uh, you know, <laughs> unlikely it is that we're going to get uh, mentioned in, um, you know, in, in, in whether it's uh, the prime minister speaking or any of the health secretary speaking or whoever really, uh, considering that, you know, we are a frontline force. And for all those pharmacists watching and people who use pharmacies and have had strong and positive experiences from them, just a key message really, right? you know, we are on the front lines. We are dealing with situations on a daily basis. And if there's one thing I want to do over the next six to eight months is make that mark and get pharmacy in people's perceptions. So at the moment, uh, I, I did a previous um, video where I said, I just don't feel, you know, people often say we people don't know what pharmacies do. I think the problem's even more than that. I, I just think we're just not in people's uh, subconscious and, and, you know, on a conscious level, people know pharmacies exist, but we don't have an emotional connection with them. And that's because we're not connecting with the public uh, in, in an emotional way in which they look at us as a solution, not just for their prescriptions, but just generally. So hopefully what we talk about today will um, kind of show what is possible because this should bring that connection where, you know, you, if you are a non-medical prescriber, if you are doing consultations within your pharmacy, you know, it is that one-to-one -one personal contact and that makes a lot of difference. Um, we'll also be talking about in the future, you know, even front of the counter, how you should be approaching and communicating uh, with your patients to have that dialogue with them to ensure that, you know, they are having that connection with yourself uh, and then really understanding where you are in their life, in, in their lifestyle. So it's really important. Okay, thank you, Vaseem. Right, good evening, everyone. And uh, thank you for being here today, this evening. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Fahim. I'm a pharmacist prescriber, contractor, and one of the founders of Medlearn. And I am joined today by my elder brother and co-founder of Medlearn. Vaseem, nice to have you here today. Yep, I think nice to be here for the like fourth time. I suppose we said that so many yeah. times. Yeah, and uh, before we actually continue, what I would like to do is just to make a short announcement uh, regarding an event that we are hosting on the 20th of April in Manchester, all to do with the future of pharmacy and aesthetics and so forth. So I am just going to, sorry folks, just uh, apologies. Let me just unmute this and get one of uh, 
one of our colleagues, Toidul, to announce the event, who should be should be joining us soon. Here we go. Uh, Toidul, can you can you hear me? I can hear you. Yeah. Fantastic. So yeah, if you're able to introduce, what's, what's this event about? Hi guys. So this event is all about aesthetics and how, as a pharmacist, whether you're a um, whether you're a pharmacy owner or you're just a local pharmacist with uh, no premises, how you can set up your own clinic, what you need to do to um, be certified, uh, the courses, the quality of course. So there's so many different companies out there providing these courses. How do you know what's a good company or who to go with? So um, we've also teamed up with MedLearn to run this training at this event um, where we also have a live model who will be uh, at, the, at the event so you can see how uh, a procedure works when they do a filler or a Botox, the, the anatomy and what's required. Obviously nowadays everyone thinks they can do a short course and you know do a filler or a, um, <clears throat> or a Botox but it requires real skill if you want to really enhance your business if you want to be at the top of the game. You need the right skill and the right training to to be, to be what basically well known and be successful in, in this area because it, there is a lot of competition. So the event on 20th is co-host, co-organized but with Barclays Ego Labs. Um, and it, it is all about the changing face and how we can, as a, even as a pharmacy owner, how you can increase your revenue stream um, with the, all these cuts that are coming in. Um, you want to obviously keep afloat. And this is a really good area um, that a lot of companies are, cashing in on at the moment but as I said if you can do a really good job of it then uh, it's not just a just a side revenue it can become a, a very significant part of your uh, business revenue. Brilliant so this is happening on the 20th of April is that correct? Yes 20th of April 7 p.m 7 till 9 30 p.m um, at the Barclays Eagle Lab opposite Albert Square in Manchester. Brilliant, that's fine. Thank you, Tadul. And we will leave a link at the end of the webinar uh, in, in the chat and uh, anybody who's interested, I believe we have around 10 places left. Tadul, uh, is there a maximum of 100? Is, is that right? 100, yeah, it's a small 100. area, so a small um, location. So the maximum is 100 and we have a lot of interest from dentists and other professionals who want to attend the event as well because we're all part of the Barclays network. Uh, I mean, obviously we've We've tried to keep it exclusive to four pharmacists, um, but it is getting booked up very, very quick. Fantastic. So that's on the 20th of April, starting at seven o'clock in Manchester. There'll be myself, there'll be Tohedul, there'll be Barclays. And what we're talking about is, in, in a nutshell, is how you can benefit financially. And, you know, if you're considering aesthetics, what things do you need to consider before you start to invest on these training programs and so forth. But that is on the 20th of April, folks. So... I look forward to seeing you there and let's move on. Thank you, Tohidul, and let's move on to the, to the webinar. Right, so let's crack on with this. So what are the learning outcomes? So just going through some, some, some something that is gonna be important for you to be able to understand at the end of this presentation. So I think it's important to have a brief kind of background information of how non-medical prescribing actually came into existence. We're also going to be giving you the opportunity at the end of this to reflect on why you want to undertake the non-medical prescribing course. Because for me, in my experience, having done this for best part of three years now and gone through the ups and downs, if you're gonna take anything away from this, that is you need to have a solid reason and a firm reason as to why you want to undertake non-medical prescribing. And we're gonna be touching on that folks. It's really important to make sure you have a plan, you have a vision, and it's, it, it needs to be more than just, I want to make money. And we'll touch on that in a second. You'll also be able to maximize the opportunities to benefit financially. We'll get into that. Uh, you'll also have the opportunity and the understanding to be able to select a university to gain your qualification. And we'll be looking into how you select the university, which one you want to go with. We're also going to be ensuring that you're prepared for further study. Now, I remember when I did my non-medical prescribing, you know, I hadn't been in higher education for best part of, I think, seven years. No, no, I think six years at least, or five, six years. And it was totally, totally different to be, to be, you know, to be 
to be studying and educating back in the in the university frame again. In addition to that, you know, you'll have the opportunity to be able to select a product and how Medland can help you and support you on your journey. So let's crack on to the non-medical prescribing timeline. So 1986, we had the Cumberledge report. And basically what that established was that nurses would diagnose, but doctors would prescribe. Now folks, there's a problem with that. And that is that if, if for example, me and Vaseem are in the pharmacy and Vaseem is making the diagnosis, but I'm prescribing, who's liable? Vaseem, who's liable? If you're prescribing. And so you're seeing a patient, you're making the diagnosis, but then calling me saying, I've got a patient who's got tonsillitis, write a prescription. Mm -hmm. Where's the liability? Is it you, is it me? It's both. That's, that's it. So there was, what they realized was it was very common practice for nurses to visit patients, make the diagnosis, consult with the doctor, and write a prescription. Okay. The trouble that you had with, with that was who's legal, you know, legally responsible. Is it the doctor making the, prescri you know, making the prescription when the nurse is diagnosing, or is it the nurse? So what they then decided was in 1992 that nurses would be allowed to prescribe. Again, hats off to nurses who are, you know, who are really proactive and are absolutely, you know, always innovating and pushing the boundaries. But if it wasn't for nurses, folks, you know, pharmacists or paramedics and you know optometrists and so forth, we all probably wouldn't be wouldn't be prescribing. Then we had 1997. That was the current report. And that explored the need for change and recommended that other healthcare professionals should be allowed to apply for prescribing. So, you know, last, last, last week we did a webinar about how things actually come into, come into reality and how they come into, come into the forefront. What's really important to understand that everything happens way before we actually get to know about it, unless you're keeping an eye on policy. Non-medical prescribing, the, the groundwork started in 1986. And it was then in 2002 when pharmacists were allowed to become supplementary prescribers. And it was back in 2005 where pharmacists could eventually be able to diagnose and treat and work independently as an IP because that's what an IP is. So if you haven't read the reports, you know, pay, but you know, you're more than welcome to have a read of them. But this just highlights the importance of making sure you know what's happening around you in anything you do, whether it's aesthetics training, whether it's, you know, the coronavirus, for example, or you know, pharmacy business, it's very important for you to know what is happening around you. How is policy influencing what's gonna happen in the future? So again, that's just a brief introduction into how non-medical prescribing you know, kind of came into existence. And again, you know, nurses are very proactive and I think we should take a leaf from their book and start to you know, be more proactive in our profession. And it's something you mentioned earlier on about pharmacists you know, really engaging and really highlighting what they do uh, more than just you know no i think on on you know on these shop floors and uh, working in teams where you know we're there we're proactive we do get seen but in terms of general public perception uh, we're, we're just not there yet great stuff right so why bother with non-medical prescribing now i i did intend this session to be interactive and i did want to get some thoughts on those individuals who are not or are prescribing or are considering prescribing to see what your what your thoughts were if you're able to maybe leave a message on the chat we can discuss it but more importantly you need to be thinking why do i need to do my non-medical prescribing what's my reason for this what's the what's the plan you know you get this qualification then what do i do with it do i have a do i have an opportunity do i have a plan in place and i'll talk about my my basically idea and what that was having ran a hundred hour pharmacy we we both you know having read policy and i've talked about it in many of my webinars about reading literature and you know doing research around yourself and finding out what's happening locally nationally what we both realized was there's a shortage of doctors shortage of nurses the healthcare systems in a crisis people need to be seen and they need good health care that's right so it made sense that as a pharmacist, you're accessible. You don't need to be, you know, you don't need an appointment, you can be seen. So non-medical prescribing was the next step forward. 
I have always been a firm believer that money is a byproduct. It's not the result. So if you're offering value to people, you will always make money. Remember that, you know, if you're offering value, you're always going to make money. Don't keep your thinking and your mindset. Oh, I want to make money. If you chase it, it's not going to come. Okay. So I saw the opportunity. I then did a survey with my patients because everything that I like to do, there's got to be some backing, some evidence based. I knew nationally what they wanted. You could, you know, that you could have a look at the NHS uh, five year plan, the five year forward view, GP forward view, and so forth. I started asking my patients. You know, a lot of people say, oh, why would people pay for their prescriptions or, you know, privately? My question to you is have you done your due diligence? Don't ask me, ask your patients. Are they willing to pay for their? for treatment if they're going to be seen then and then quality and what i found was after the survey yes they are willing to pay however the mistake i made was even though i had this great plan of what i was going to do we were going to offer prescribing services we were going to offer blood testing we were going to offer aesthetics we were going to offer telemedicine a plan alone is that enough if you don't associate with the right people what i mean by that is you can have the best plan in the world but if you don't have the right people surrounding you, it's difficult to put that into practice. And would you not agree with that, that we have tried two or three things in our business and they haven't worked? That's right. Would you say that's been so down think, to not being associated I, with? The, your network is very important, but also absolutely working with the right people um, who are experts in their field. I think that's absolutely essential. So even if you do, you know, for example, whatever you do with your non-prescribing, uh, non-medical prescribing and set up these clinics you know how are you going to market them how are you going to let people know that you're doing them who do you need to speak to to set certain parts of you know the, the the service up what kind of service do you need, need to set up are your staff fully engaged with you um are, are they part of the plan because they're going to be absolutely essential for you to be running with so what Basim has just said is literally everything in a nutshell is you should get your pens and papers out, folks, and write down, why do I want to do non-medical prescribing? What's the plan? Put money aside. You're going to make money. That's always going to come because you're offering, if you offer a good service, money will come. What's the plan? My plan was simple. Shortage of doctors, shortage of nurses. People wanted healthcare. Let's offer it to them. Let's give them a solution. Why should in this, in the 21st century, why should my parents, my sister, my brother, friends, family, colleagues suffer when I could develop my clinical competencies and at least give them a fantastic result then and there. Why should they suffer? And that's why I, I embarked on this journey where I said, you know what, irrespective of what happens, I'm going to develop my skills and competencies so we don't have these patients, these elderly patients who are saying, look, I can't see a doctor. I've got this condition. You know, I can't see a doctor. They end up in hospital. For me, it, it was something more than just, it was emotional. It was on, a, on, a, on another level, I'd like to say. I wanted to find a solution for my local population. And we had so many aunties, uncles, friends who were coming through saying, you know what, I can't get to the doctor. I, ca I can't be seen. And then the infection has developed further, the poor thing, you know, they end up in hospital. But if nurses can prescribe, then why can't a pharmacist with the right training? So my vision and plan was bigger than just, oh, I want to make 30, 40 quid. That was going to happen anyway. You want to help patients. Right, I've got a question, I think, here. Sorry. Uh, uh, Thanks, Mo. Is somebody? Yeah, Mohammed. Um, so Mohammed's on as well. Uh, Mohammed, by the way, has just joined the General Pharmaceutical Council. So congratulations, Mo. Well done, Mohammed. For, uh, achieving that, and uh, he's a great content and insight guy. So you know, and and again, we talk about associating with the right people. Uh, Mohammed sent me a book by Simon Sinek. If you've not read it, and it's called The Infinite World, Infinite Plan, Infinite, Mi Infinite Mindset have a read of it and again you see being associated with the right people they motivate you they encourage you they keep you positive and they keep you dedicated and focused on the right path this is the this is the advantage of being with the the, the people with the same mindset also i'm just going to touch on that um as i said pharmacists generally pharmacies aren't so proactive especially on social media and people like mohammed doido um you know uh darren there's the whole group of these guys and girls who what we'll do is, you know, we'll share each other's content, we'll support each other's content, because generally we're, we're all like-minded. We have the same feelings towards our profession and, and just generally 
towards business, right? And having these guys for support makes a humongous difference, especially getting the word out there. And you know, this is something fairly new in terms of what we've started. So having all these people's supporters makes the absolute difference and vice versa for us to support them in their achievements. And this is what I mean by having the right networks and, and working with the right people, because without them, it's, it's you know, you kind of by yourself. So why do you want to do medical prescribing? What's your plan? My vision was straightforward. It was emotionally challenging. It was more than just, I want to make money because when, when it's the difficult days, when you can't get up in the morning, you're tired, you've had a bad day, what motivates you? But we'll be touching on that later. Secondly, again, it's important to know what's happening around you. I wanted to in sync myself with the vision of the NHS. It made sense. And it's just saying short to your doctors, let's provide them the solution. Improve access to care, spread your knowledge and help others. Folks, that's really important. The more you give, it's gonna come back in return. So the purpose of this slide was to get you to think, what do you want to do? I gave you a brief history of what my rationale was as well as growing my business, but there was more to it. So, you know, again, Sakib, thank you for your kind comments. Uh, it's, it's really important to make sure that you have a vision and a plan of why you want to do non-medical prescribing. Otherwise, remember guys, non-medical prescribing has been around since 2006. I'm not the first, I'm not the last. So you don't want to end up doing a qualification and not using it, right? Okay, so how do I become a non-medical prescriber? This is it. How do I become a non-medical prescriber? Firstly, two years, you have to be qualified as a pharmacist. And I believe at the top of my head, pharmacists, nurses, paramedics. I'm not sure totally if optometrists can become IPs or is it just supplementary prescribing? But certainly for pharmacists, you have to be qualified for two years. Now, before you undertake your prescribing, my advice to you all is develop your clinical skills before or alongside. Don't waste your time like I did. If you haven't been qualified for two years, you have two years to develop your clinical skills. If you have been qualified for two years, please, please, please don't do your non-medical prescribing, spend six months like I did, it works out to about a year, and then spend another two years of learning because you've not realized that actually the prescribing qualification is not there to teach you clinical skills. It is your responsibility to be competent in the area that you choose to prescribe. You are a regulated healthcare professional. You are licensed. You make the decision. It is not a clinical skills course. So if you are deciding to do non-medical prescribing, either you get your clinical skills, and we'll discuss that in a second, in sync with your prescribing, and, I, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Or if you've not been qualified for two years, focus on developing your clinical skills and we'll be touching on that in a second. So once you've, you've got a plan now, you understand that I wanna do everything at the same time because I don't wanna waste time. I don't wanna spend six months of my life, time, which is the biggest asset that you have, including your health, obviously, that you have, you know, I could be spending time with my family, children, wife, instead I'm studying, and then you're having to spend another year. You don't, folks, you don't need to do that. There's a right way to do it. There's a quicker way to do it. So think about that. How do I make sure that once I've got my qualification, whichever area that I want to prescribe in, I'm ready for it, and I'm not chasing my tail. Then you find a university, right? I spent three years trying to get into a particular university, and it was not a good idea. It, it doesn't really matter what university that you're going into. What's more important is getting the qualification. What's, what's more important, and, and we've got a, a wonderful comment by Kimberly, thank you. And she said, reason for wanting to pursue NMP, increased value to current patient-centered care, I'm giving to have an appetite for learning and wanting to upskill, wonderful. Three, the pharmacy profession is changing not to be left behind absolutely spot on well done you know that that you know she summarized it beautifully that, that's that so sorry but yeah finding a university right it doesn't matter which university you go to as such you are not studying pharmacy you're not studying medicine that it matters that oh i'm i went to Oxford university or i went to london school of pharmacy or i went to king's 
ultimately it's the qualification is what you need to get. Yes, you do your due diligence, have a look around, find a university that you know you would like to go with. You might have personal preferences, but having spent three years of trying to get into a particular university, and at the end of it, the qualification was going to be very similar. And if I was looking for a job, no one was ever going to say to me, oh, wait, you didn't go to King's, so you're not going to get a prescribing qualification. For me, you know, folks, I don't think you need to be spending too much time thinking about that. Yes, I'm sure, uh, you know, you could, you, you could, uh, yes, obviously, you know, some, some students are saying that they make sure, yes, make sure the course is accredited. That's, that's one thing you've got to make sure, make sure your course is GPAC accredited. But in terms of selecting a university, it, there is so much competition. Ultimately, what you want to make sure at the end of it is I get my qualification and I'm developing my clinical skills. It's not the university folks that are going to be teaching you the clinical skills unless you enroll on a clinical skills course with them. Keep that in mind. The non-medical prescribing qualification is not a clinical course unless it's part of a different course. So don't waste your time. I told you I spent three years trying to get into one university and eventually I still didn't get in that university. And I went to a different university, but it didn't make a difference. So advice, find a university, get in. Open university now, do it at your leisure. Yeah, and I think Wasim is doing his prescribing qualification this year through Open. I think so. I have three students already who are on the Open University portal doing it through there. So again, plenty of universities. Finding a DMP or a designated prescribing practitioner. This is the major question. How do I find a DMP? I remember speaking to Wasim and I asked Wasim, how do I find a DMP? And what he said was, what value are you giving in return? Because if they're giving you value to teach you and to give you this qualification, what are you giving in return? And it's not about financial, it's not monetary. What are you giving in return? So I went to the surgeries after being rejected by so many local surgeries, nope, nope. Nope, nope, nope. I think seven said, you said, not going to happen. I went to Wasim and Wasim said, okay, what are you offering them? Oh, I just tell them I want to become a non-medical prescriber. And can I please do shadowing? Okay. And what did they get out of it? Uh, nothing. So Wasim said, why don't you offer them support? Why don't you say to them, actually, for those hours that I'm putting in, I will, sorry, I think we're having we're having questions being asked and it can make it kind of tricky when I'm trying to do two things at the same time. And I'm really struggling with this at the moment. Sorry, folks. I to, yeah, I think we're going to have to, let me just quickly get out this presentation and quickly answer the burning question. And the question is, it's on the chat, so I can't even see it. Sorry, guys. Uh, what is the difference between no medical prescriber and a pharmacist independent prescriber? Same thing. Okay, sorry, my bad. Right. So for those of you who don't know, uh, and, and it is confusing, a non-medical prescriber and a, and a prescribing pharmacist is the same thing. If you're a doctor, you're a medical prescriber. If you're not a doctor, you're a non-medical prescriber. It all, it basically, you're an independent ph prescribing pharmacist. It's the same thing, but the term is used interchangeably independent prescriber or IP. Doctors are normally medical prescribers. If you right hand click, it should allow that to open. Canterbury University. Okay, Sadhika is saying Canterbury University offers the NAP module for the head doctor. Doctors and dentists are prescribers. Any other healthcare uh, practitioner is a non-medical prescriber. So there's the answer folks. So the difference is if you are a if you are not a pharmacist, then if you're not, sorry guys, let me just get rid of this screen. I'm being distracted with this and I'm struggling now with this Zoom. Just to uh, add a point in terms of, if you're asking how do I convince uh, my local surgery or any uh, GP to be my DMP or DPP, um, it really comes down to how you communicate it. And this is why brush up on your communication skills, your language skills, your linguistic skills. Uh, any persuasion skills uh, and value is important absolutely in terms of what you're going to offer them but how that message is conveyed is also important so key rule if you right. don't uh already did it, <laughs> how do we get out of this it. it's going to use 
Hey, you see, this is why he needs me to sort his. Uh, I'm drawing on out. my slides. So if you just press escape, there you go. And click that. There you go. And then just go to chat. There you go. How do I get out of this? I can't change the slide. This was not intended, folks. But now, because you keep asking me questions, which is fine, I can't seem to get out of this. You've gone in pro mode, that's why. Stop share. Escape. Right. So yeah, uh, going back to that point about how you convince them, uh, brush up absolutely on your communication skills, your linguistics, and, and how you're going to offer them value. So for example, when you're going to ask the big question, oh, can you become my prescriber? You might just get a no straight away. Start with the smaller yeses first. So go to your surgeries, introduce yourself, have a conversation about, you know, what is happening at the surgery? What are the issues they're having? Yeah, you know, having those conversations as a starting point is building your rapport, which is absolutely essential. And then it starts with small little yeses. For example, offer to help them where they need some help and then, then drop the big question. You know, generally that is the way to bypass any barrier or any kind of... Um, uh, so you know. I, well, basically give them value in return. I went to my surgery and I said to them, look, in return for you offering me a time to be in you know, shadow one of the doctors. I'm happy to work and help you on your medicines optimization. I'm happy to change your prescribing patterns into 28 day prescribing. I'm happy to work on reconciliating your doc man. I'm happy, no, we're not gonna answer anything now because it kind of throws me off. So folks, we will answer your questions at the end because it really starts, starts to kind of take time. So I'll, I'll get to this at the end. So what you need to do is basically offer the value in return. So I went to the surgeon and said, look, I will start to train your staff, especially your non-medical staff. So your receptionist, I will train them and give them basic skills. So when they're answering the phone, they can make better informed decisions. I also said to them that I will help you with your document. So any document that you receive, uh, you know, discharge letters, I will then appropriately triage them to the doctor or action them if their medication changes. I'm also happy to do blood pressure tests. So in return for them offering me 90 hours, I spent around, I think 10 hours a month. The surgeries that said no, why did they say no? Because I wasn't, I, I wasn't giving them anything in return. Okay. It was because I was saying to them, look, I want 90 hours. And I was assuming that they were just, which is, I don't know why, but they're just gonna just allow me to just do my prescribing. What and, made you realize the flip? When I spoke with you. Okay. And you told me that you need to, you know. But, but, but how did you come up with the strategy that, okay, because I know what you did, right? right? But how did you do that? You know, just, just talk about what steps you took. So I emailed the practice manager. First of all, phone call. Yeah. I did a phone call, first of all, because just going into a doctor's surgery, can I speak to the practice manager? Yeah. It's not going to work, folks. I did a phone call. Right. To some practices, I actually wrote a handwritten letter mm -hmm. in a brown envelope. The and writing, the, did you read your yeah, writing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, my writing's not really legible, but handwritten letter, brown envelope. That was probably a good thing. Yeah, addressed to the practice manager. He opened it, rang back and said, Fahim, actually, you know, I got three offers and we're interested. And, you know, you know, we, we're happy to, you know, we're happy to discuss how you can help us. And I put down, look, the benefits of you having a pharmacist in your practice, medicines optimization, doc man. Uh, you know, managing your repeats, putting your prescriptions from an, an usual 28 day dispensing into repeat dispensing, uh, it, sorting out your out of stocks, giving you a bulletin. So I listed around 10, 15 things that I said, look, you're wasting time. I'm happy in return to give you this. And they, they jumped on it. Why not? Why would you not? You know, all I had to do was sit in there for 90 hours. In return, I was offering this to them. And you get your GPs on board, you get your surgeries on board. It requires you to be proactive and give them something in return. How can you give them value? If you can jot these three, four things down and jot them down. So Docman, for those of you who don't work in GP practices, that is where they get all these letters from different surgeries, from hospitals, and they have to be basically it's like it's like an admin job, but it requires you know a good medical understanding. So you, you might get a discharge somewhere that says these, these, these drugs are now changed you would make the changes, give that to the doctor to review, saves time. Patients who were, you know, were on repeats that needed actioning, I would action that for them. I also actually started spending time in their dispensary. 
because we had a, uh, a, a GP surgery that had a dispensary. So I started to make that profitable for them. I taught them how to use the drug tariff. I taught them how to buy properly. I taught them how to, you know, how to, you know, how to control your stock properly. So there's, there's plenty of things. And if you're not sure, just get in touch with me that you can discuss in order to get yourself with that doctor. And actually now it doesn't have to be a doctor. It could be a suitably qualified pharmacist. If you're trained for two years, you're able to be a, you know, I think it's two years and you can che check the guidance. You're able to be a, 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 a prescriber, or, you know, uh, acting as a prescriber. So you have to offer some value in return. Be smart, call the surgery, find out who's your practice manager. Fantastic. If you've got good relationship with the doctors, have a conversation with one of the doctors. Explain to them also what it entails. Because sometimes they just get, they just think, oh my God, you know, I'm gonna have to be spending God knows how long teaching you and so forth. Make it clear that that's all, that this is the requirement, this is the, the needs. Also, what you have to be aware of is some doctors may not be happy to sign you off unless you don't, you know, you're not meeting their standards. So just keep that in mind. Again, have a clear discussion with your doctors that this is the requirement. Again, universities can help you with that. Be prepared to study at level seven. Studying at level seven requires that you are now studying autonomously, you're working alone, you are proactive in your studying, you're able to write essays. There's a lot that kind of goes in. It's not difficult, but when you've not been in university for so long, it can get a bit tricky. You know, writing essays to level seven standards. And if you're unsure, have a look at Bloom's taxonomy. It talks about pharmacists and those students working at higher education, making sure that they're on a, they're going past just memorization. So it's more than memorization. It's now about you having the skills and knowledge and applying that knowledge. Develop your scope of practice. Now, this is important. This is important. When you do your prescribing, don't choose a topic that's very difficult for yourself. I'll give you an example. I chose hypertension to start my practice in. I eventually was gonna delve out to minor illnesses, but the reason I chose hypertension was because the diagnosis, there's so much literature out there that it's very easy, I'm easier, I'd say, than maybe diagnosing an acute condition, right? There's nice guidelines, there's sign guidelines. I've picked a very narrow scope. So I said, I want to develop my prescribing qualifications in hypertension for adults between 30 and 50, uh, hypertension stages one and two with no comorbidities very clearly defined, clearly defined my scope of practice. So I knew that when it came to writing an essay, I don't have to worry about diabetes. I don't have to worry about somebody suffering with heart failure, just pure hypertension. And the reason was because I was developing my skills. I don't need to make things more complicated than they already were going to be with developing your prescribing qualification. I don't need to make it complicated. So I chose a very basic, serious, the focused set of standards and all the students on a MedLearn Mastery program, I've told them the same thing. Choose a scope of practice that is going to be very defined and easy for you to practice in for the six months that you're doing this course. Don't be he-man and choose something like, oh, I'm just gonna you know, diagnose and treat all minor illnesses. A minor illness is a minor. You might think it's minor, but it could be, it could turn out to be something major, okay? And it's difficult. You have a patient who comes with a cough, all of a sudden that cough could be respiratory, it could be cardiovascular, it could be the abdomen, it could be the vestibular cochlear system, it could be anything. Great question for you. So Go on. So you've mentioned the clinical uh, points uh, in terms of what you would consider yeah. someone comes in a cough, but since obviously you've been practicing longer, and yeah. I've been going on to you about functional medicine, how much time do you now also dedicate towards not just looking at the clinical symptoms presented but the social factors environmental factors you know what's going on in their lives or, or yep. you know that's that's getting them to that so i'll briefly touch on this and, and what was is saying is is in a nutshell it's not all about prescribing it's about taking a holistic approach you we are we are human we have cells cells it's not all about writing prescriptions nutrition your mental state who you're surrounded by your activities, everything makes a difference to your physiology and how that physiology presents itself and you know you developing pathology and disease. So 
the point what seems trying to make is that don't just focus on prescribing, take a holistic approach. And when you write your essays, universities will encourage you to take a holistic approach. When I did my hypertension, they said, okay, fine, you're gonna start them on a beta blocker. What about their salt intake? Yeah. What about their dietary requirements? What about exercise? So what he's trying to say is, is don't just focus on- And also what's going on in here. And, and, and you know, again, we could spend all day talking about mental health, but just make sure that you have a narrow scope of practice. And there's a misconception that is that if I develop my prescribing qualification hypertension, how can I prescribe in, 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 you know, in diabetes or minor illness? It's like anything, you start off with a narrow scope and then you develop your scope. You go further, you go further, you go further. Start off with something straightforward and then we take it from there. And we'll answer all your questions in, in a second. Think of the cost and time investment. I think it costs, when I calculated it, as a pharmacist and a business owner, I think it costs up to 15,000 pounds. That was time off at university, 24 study days. I think it's a bit less now. It also included having locum cover, exams. It cost about 15,000 pounds. So think about that. Exams, you're gonna have a pharmacology exam. You have a numeracy test, law test, and they also have some universities also give you OSCEs. And that is where they will give you a scenario and you have to do the examination and then pass that side. So these are the kind of things that you've, you've got to consider. Are you, if we have a look at, if I have a look at, if there's a burning question quickly, as much as I said, I don't want to answer it. I will have a look at what that is. So the questions are from the chat. It says, right, let me have a look. So we have some questions and they are, I don't know how I can actually go up, but the question is, uh, how can a community pharmacist specialize in a field and then prove to this to the university that there is a need for a prescriber in the community. That's probably from with the application process. How can, a how can a community pharmacist specialize in a field and then prove this to the university that there is a need for a prescriber in the community? I'm, I'm not too sure. I'm not too sure what, what you meant by that question. I think, I think you're referring to uh, the uh, application process. Uh, if, if, I think that's what they're saying. Okay, Roman, I if you can rewrite that question, I'm not too sure what you meant by that. Uh, I'm not, the rest of us did the hours whilst he had all that time off. That's how he managed it. That's not that's not all true. <laughs> that is not all true. That, that that's that, what I remember. That's not, <laughs> yeah, like this white hair didn't just happen. That, <laughs> there was a reason and this is it so Kimberly's question is how did you manage your time to include the 90 hours required offering value to the GP and having a full-time job as well as studying I never said I had a full-time job but anyway and having a full-time full job, job as well as studying for the NMP did you work full-time 15,000 can you break down the cost okay so uh can we get to that at the end I'll, I'll finish off everything we'll get to that at the end it will definitely be be worth it as all oh, your skills are driving for life. Uh, yeah, let's leave Q and A till the end, please. Yeah, you're right. Let's let's leave it till the end. Otherwise, I'll get distracted. Uh, I'll I'll we'll answer all your questions. We will answer all your questions. Let's let's just continue. Right. So uh, I need to now cancel this. And... Okay. So we'll we'll discuss the cost exams. I think we're okay with that. If you've got any burning questions, we'll go through that. Books that I would recommend. So what books would I recommend for, for, for you guys to develop your anatomy and physiology? Anatomy and physiology, there are so many books. Ultimately, you need to find a book that is useful for you. Gray's Anatomy and Snell is a textbook and it's probably gonna be, honestly speaking, it'll probably take you two to three years to get your head around that. If you're a medicine student, that's what they study, Gray's Anatomy of Snell. If you write down uh, Snell's Clinical Review, that's a good book. There's another good book called Anatomy and Physiology for Dummies. And they do a, they, they, they actually do a really good series on, it, on everything. So that, that's something that I found was quite good. But if you're looking for a textbook, Gray's Anatomy, trouble is 3000 pages. 
And then physiology can also be like three, 4,000 pages, but it depends what you're looking for. If you want a quick skim and a quick overview to be able to safely prescribe and treat and so forth, then maybe one of the you know anatomy and physiology books for dummies would be quite useful. Uh, I personally use Gray's and Vanders, but that's because I, I have a vast interest because I teach. And I genuinely just love the, you know, I have a, I have a huge admiration for this, the way the human body functions. And I have a thirst for knowledge and I, I just want to know it inside out. I could spend hours, uh, Kimberly, touching on your question, I can spend hours learning this topic because I love, I, I love what I do. When I'm exercising, I've not got music on, I've got one of my podcasts on, or I've got a anatomy and physiology lecture. When I'm driving, I'll have a podcast on, I make time. There is, there's no time for anyone. Time doesn't wait for anyone. You have to make time. Something my, my mother always taught me that for him, time doesn't wait for anyone. You've got to make time. So in those six months, I didn't waste my time. If I had, you know, if even when I'm at work, I will have a lecture on what everybody can listen to. It could be a lecture on anatomy. It could be a lecture on physiology. I don't waste my time because I know the more knowledge I have, the more I develop my clinical skills, I can help people. I can make a difference to people's life. And I absolutely love it. I love the human body from anatomy to physiology, microbiology. So I, I make time. Uh, if you don't believe me, ask my wife. She will tell you. Another book is internal medicine book. So an internal medicine book is what GPs will study. And it's all about signs, symptoms, differential diagnosis. Harrison's is a great internal, internal medicine book, about 6,000 pages. But most conditions are going to be in there. From the physical examination to the signs to the symptoms, to the treatment, the rationale, it's there. Harrison's, Harrison's Internal Medicine, have a look at it. A book on differential diagnosis, if you can see it, and I'll have it there as well. Write this down. It's called Symptom Sorter, fifth edition by Keith Hopcroft and Vincent Fort. Mind blowing book. If there's anything that I've used so much throughout my two years, it's this book. Because, what, because you've got to remember folks that people present with symptoms. People don't present with diagnosis. So a patient presents with a cough, I could go into the book and say, okay, I've got this patient who's got a cough, that's an acute cough. Or let's say, let's say I don't know, let, let me pick a condition uh, a bit that we can all relate with. Let's have a look. Shortness of breath. So I have a patient who presents with shortness of breath. And it says it could be the common differentials are asthma, pneumonia, acute left ventricular failure, acute exacerbation of COPD, hyperventilation. Occasionally it can be a pneumothorax, pulmonary embolism, da da da. Rarely you can have aspiration, pneumonitis, chemo, uh, hypovolemic shock. It tells you the possible investigations, so unit analysis, butum culture, and top tips. It's really good to quickly get the diagnosis in your mind. So, Sometimes I have patients think earache, earache. Let's quickly think there's otitis media, there's otitis externa, but what else could it be? You've got the trigeminal nerve. We know that the motor system and the sensory system, how they can link and supply the body, it's a bit more than just the cranial nerve number eight, the vestibular cochlear nerve. It could also be the trigeminal nerve. The book will tell you that earache could also be related to the jaw. So it allows me to think that have a broader perspective. It also quickly gives two, three diseases that you can't miss. You know, imagine somebody presented with chest pain. You really folks don't want to misdiagnose a heart attack. That, that's, that's not going to go down too well. So it makes me think when I'm taking a history and a physical exam, I'm thinking, okay, there are these conditions that I cannot, rule, that I cannot miss. And it gives you those. Also, I love it for dermatology. How important is dermatology in our practice? I think uh, a good 58% of uh, the kind of uh, inquiries we have are related to dermatology skin conditions. And, you know, it, it's not just the physical symptoms it present with, it's the uh, mental effects it has on these patients. So uh, I, just to give you a case study, we have a patient who came in and was buying bottles and bottles of rosehip oil. Uh, and because, you know, he was like, I, I've, I've suffered from this and, you know, I, I feel really uncomfortable with the way I look. So, you know, it's, it's essential that, uh, you know, that is one area that you do have a good understanding for because you will have lots of clues in regard to that. 
dermatology is so important. I think out of the 10,000 pound a month that we're doing on our, on, on our prescribing, uh, I think majority of that, or at least, uh, what do you say, 40% or maybe more? Yeah, yeah in, in terms of sales, uh, which I'm gonna, you, you're looking at least 38.8%. Yeah, is on dermatology. The book is great. So again, you, it, it, you need to get to the hang of how to use the book. It's called Differential Diagnosis in Dermatology, fourth edition. That's LinkedIn, that's for Zoom. And it's great. It will tell you, for example, you know, if a patient presents with an acute rash on the trunk and the limbs, and it's uh, erythematous, it's got exudate, erosions, it could be uh, echithema, it could be impetigo, herpes simplex, you know, acute eczema, discoid eczema. I've used it so much. I had a patient last week who presented with a, a particular, they went to the GP, GP couldn't diagnose it, but because one of the areas that I specialize in dermatology, I just couldn't think of the name, but the book is, once you get used to how to use the book, amazing, okay. lifesaver. Darshan just mentioned um, anatomy and physiology for dummies is available on Amazon and is discounted at the moment. So uh, a good one to uh, yeah. have a look at. I, I've not actually read anatomy and physiology for dummies, but they do a very good series because I read their microbiology for dummies series. So I know they're a good series, but I, I don't that there are a lot of short books. There's also anatomy and physiology made incredibly easy. That's another real good. Oh, another real good one is anatomy and physiology at a glance. It's a series for doctors. It's called Anatomy and Physiology at a Glance. They do pharmacology at a glance. They do anatomy at a glance. They do a huge range. So that's another really, really good textbook, even for pre regs It's at a glance series. So re really look into that as well. Pharmacology, guys, come on. We can't do anything less than this. Can't be less than the Rangendale. Really? Yeah. If a pharmacist says to me that they're not going to be looking at the Rangendale. Like, you will remember this. You know, you can. Can't fact, be. If any of our tutors were watching, we are officially now holding this book and we're probably paying more interest to this now than we ever did before. And they kept going on to us about it. If you, if you, <laughs> pharmacology book, folks, that's the one. But there is one by Anatomy at a Glance. Uh, sorry, there's one by the At a Glance called Pharmacology at a Glance. It's what I used for my pre reg training. Fantastic. But if you really want a textbook and you want to teach and you want to know it properly, that's the one. History Taking and Physical Examination, McLeod's. Great book, a bit more in depth. So that's the McLeod series there. Another one is the Bates. Bates to a great series as well. So that's, that's just quickly, briefly going over to the books and we can discuss, I can give the references later on for you. Uh, but you know, these books you're investing in yourselves before you do start to buy books, do you do you research and, and really ask yourself, why do you need the books? What's the plan? Don't just start spending money. Uh, I have a habit of collecting books and I've got, I've got a library and I just keep every, you know, if you're gonna buy me a present, any one of you get me a book. I love books. Uh, so Mohammed, thank you for the book, Yusuf. Right, pitfalls. No support network and mentoring. If you are gonna do your non-medical prescribing, you don't have a support network. You don't have access to doctors. You don't have access to clinicians. You are gonna find yourself in trouble. Medicine, as much as it is a science, is an art. You need to have a support network. You need to have colleagues who you can speak with, who you can refer when you're starting off. Just think of your peer edge. Imagine you fresh out of university and were told to start practicing as a pharmacist. It's not gonna happen. And university course that you're doing, which is the independent prescribing, it's going to be very difficult for you to justify in the law if you make a mistake and say, oh, but I've got my qualification. What training did you have? What logs have you kept? What support network do you have? And take it from me, folks. I've had my GPAC inspection and CQC. They're going to want to ask what support network do you have? If you're prescribing for all these conditions, are you working with a team? Or are you all alone? And we can touch on that later on. So even after two years of doing this, I have Dr. Akib, I have Dr. Hassan, Dr. Amna Khan, Dr. Rahimi, cardiologist. I have a group of doctors, Dr. Thezin, who I can call up. And if I'm unsure, I can speak with because I want to learn. That's back to that point of having a network. Um, one of the things we made sure when we were planning all this, and, and so it, there's only one of us who could do it at the time, 
and uh, when we discussed it, I said to him, one of the most important things for you, other than the, the knowledge that you're going to have to learn, other than the business, uh, you know, kind of uh, steps you're going to have to take to put this into action is having the right people to support us. And this is where your networks are going to be essential, which is going to come back to what we're going to do with MedLearn in terms of your leadership, your communication skills, your persuasion skills, uh, how to build rapport. So if you've, if you've not read the recent PDE advice that was about two, three months ago about pharmacists and GP practice who got into hot water, have a look at that. It talks about this. It's really important to make sure that you work within your competencies and develop your competency. Don't just think that oh, all of a sudden this patient who presents with a rash, it's definitely cellulitis or this throat infection is definitely tonsillitis. And what if it turns out to be, let me give you an example. You have a patient who has symptoms of tonsillitis. You give them a penicillin, you misdiagnose it and it was infectious monoclonosis and they get a rash. You could be sued for that. There was a case where a doctor did exactly that and he was sued. He was sued because that guy said, look, because of the misdiagnosis, I couldn't go attend my law events. I've missed out on this much earning. The doctor was sued. Because they've not, you know, you've not, you've not thought about it deep enough. You've just thought, oh, yeah, this is definitely this tonsillitis antibiotics. You've not even thought, you know, what your rationale was. How would you document that? That actually, I did think about this. I did, you know, uh, you know, palpate the spleen and so forth, or, you know, looking for certain symptoms and X, Y, Z. And, you know, again, infectious monoclonosis, people generally get, there's a certain age group. Also, what happens is that people generally get more, more generalized, you know, uh, swelling of the lymph nodes, you know, not glands, they're not glands, they're nodes. Uh, and people, you know, th that's how you can miss, that's how you can diagnose that. Certain age groups are higher at risk. Also, they can have, you know, the, you can have enlargement of the spleen and so forth. So, you know, these are the things you've got to consider. It is, it is very similar to tonsillitis, but it presents subtly differently. And you give them an, you know, you give them a penicillin and bang, they get a rash. Okay. Secondly, not doing what you enjoy. How important is it to make sure you do what you enjoy? Absolutely. I think um, if you're going to be doing this every day, especially with the pressures you're under in our daily lives, uh, with everything that we do, um, you are going to have to enjoy it. Absolutely. But when I say enjoyment, I mean, look at it from a perspective of um, you know, take yourself away from the small part. So do you enjoy these notes? Do you enjoy these slides? Do you enjoy these topics? No, don't look at it like that. Look at it from what are you going to give uh, long term to you, not only your patient but yourself the value part meaning you know it makes you independent it gives you opportunity to set up your own clinics it gives you the opportunity to kind of uh, decide how you want your life to be that's the enjoyment yeah and and it's about that perspective you can either think about it as they oh but i don't enjoy this topic it doesn't matter you have to learn it because you need to do it the enjoyment factor of it is more to do with what you can achieve after you have these set of skills yeah. And challenge yourself, you know, not doing what you enjoy, choose something that you enjoy. If you're doing your medical prescribing, if it's going to be aesthetics, go for it. If it's going to be minor illness, go for it. But choose an area that you would feel comfortable and also be prepared to take a risk. If you think that every time that you're going to be prescribing and diagnosing, you're not taking a certain amount of risk, there's an element of risk. When you're checking that prescription, there's an element of risk. There's a risk in anything you do. When you drive a car, there's an element of risk. You can't sit on the, you know, you can't sit on the, you know, on the sidelines. You have to make a decision. Don't ignore dermatology, whether it's aesthetics, whether it's eczema, any form of dermatology. It's very important because our skin, the way we come across, you know, the mental health, acne, rosacea, so important. So Ankish Patel, thank you for the question. How are you reviewing your clinical notes or notes of others? Is there a template to ensure consistency? So uh, Anikash, thank you for that. So again, we're not really discussing here about that particular side, but what's important is to make sure you have continuity of care. When you're diagnosing, when you're treating, make sure that you're sending your case notes to your doctors, make sure you're doing evidence-based. It's extremely important to be evidence-based and having your a support network means that you're always getting peer reviewed. So all my learning, I do regular, if not monthly, then two monthly session with the doctors. I'm regularly getting peer reviewed. I'm, you know, I'm educating, I'm learning, reading papers. It's, I think that's, that's an answer to Anikash's question that it's really important to make sure that your, you know, your notes that you're keeping 
they are evidence-based and you get them reviewed, you know, it's doing audits. Again, it comes back to doing audits, but we'll discuss that a, a different day, but audits are important. So I audit my prescribing every month because I'm a huge believer in pharmacists being at the forefront for antimicrobial stewardship. I also like to compare my notes with, uh, with, with, with the standards. I do prescribe uh, unlicensed as well. I get my uh, one of my pharmacist colleagues to review my prescribing because ultimately it's difficult to audit your own work. Uh, it's also really important to make sure that, you know, I have, again, once a month, the doctors will go through what I do. Again, it's really important to make sure you have a support network and you, you, really are, you really are doing this properly and safely, especially if you're in pharmacy, anywhere you're going. Take a holistic approach to health. It is not just about prescribing. There's a lot more to it. Overconfidence. There's one thing being confident and there's one thing being overly confident or unconsciously incompetent. But you think, oh, I know everything. It doesn't work like that, folks. You don't know everything. Stay within your limits. Have a support network. Be brave, but within your limits. Make sure you have a plan. Not asking for advice. It's so important to get in touch and ask people who are doing it, get advice. Don't waste your time because they can get you from A to Z a lot quicker than you can, wasting time. Not being focused enough. You've got to be focused. You have to be focused on whatever you want to achieve. Nothing comes easy. Nothing comes easy. I'm working. I'm teaching. I'm running my Medlin business. I'm helping with the pharmacy. I'm, you know, I'm a husband. I'm a brother, a son. You've got to be focused on what you do. Okay. So how can Medlin help? So if with, with everything that's happened, how can we help? So as a result of everything that's happening, we developed a mastery program. It's taught by doctors and consultants, and it's all about making sure that for commonly seen minor illnesses within primary care, that's GP practice or pharmacy, we ensure and sign you off to be competent. It's six months of training, we help with anatomy. We teach you anatomy, physiology, pathology, microbiology, internal medicine. You get help with access to the university. We help you with your exams, entry, personal statement, essays, and so forth, any support that you need. 377 hours worth of learning, so it's equivalent to diploma. You get access to the learner management system, videos, live presentations, and it's a blended approach. So what happens is that one of the doctors will teach a regular webinar every week focusing on various areas. You get given your tasks that you need to do throughout the week. You have a, every week you have a presentation, you have to present a case study, and then you get taught face-to-face -face lectures. And you have six days worth of face-to-face -face studying as well. So that's a six months course. I've already done a video on this, but basically in a nutshell, we make sure that at the end of the six months that you can safely diagnose, treat, and manage a wide range of minor illnesses. It works for about, you know, around 50, 60 conditions, you'll be safely managing and diagnosing. However, managing and diagnosing and treating doesn't mean that you're always going to be prescribing. If you have a patient who presents with a AAA, very unlikely, you are not going to be managing that in the pharmacy, but you will have an understanding and you'll understand the anatomy, you'll understand the physiology, because I'm a firm believer, if you're going to be prescribing and you're going to be diagnosing, you need to understand anatomy, which is structure. You need to understand physiology, which is how that structure allows function, how the body functions. You also need to understand that this is normal, but when you have a disease, how those symptoms manifest, which is pathology, microbiology, and internal medicine, which are the signed symptoms. So it's a six month program. You can do it alongside your non-medical prescribing, but what it makes sure at the end of it that you can safely diagnose and prescribe for, a, for those 60, 70 range of conditions. We also map it against advanced clinical practice. Accreditation is also by a university and by the RPS. Not everybody is accepted on the course because we have an interview and you also have examinations. So you'll have an anatomy exam, a written anatomy exam, physiology exam, you'll have OSCEs, and you'll also have presentations to deliver. In addition to your clinical training, we also give you networking, business development, and entrepreneurship. Asim, was there something you wanted to add on? I to think, the uh, networking and business development? With the, with the networking and the business development, um, there's going to be focus on linguistics. So your linguistic skills, your persuasion skills, your leadership skills, and uh, there'll be a bit of NLP-based 
um, persuasion as well in there. Uh, so it's it's all the skills we've gained over the years uh, and, and utilize them. So uh, as I said, the network is essential. One of the reasons for him being able to really do well and, and grow as a clinician is because of the support he has around him. Now, as pharmacists and non-medical prescribers, if you're not in hospital, generally we're alone. This is where Medellin comes in and gives you that whole access. And also, you know, you, you're all done, you're all set and you're ready to start to practice. You're like, ah, by the way, I don't own a pharmacy. Don't worry, we're gonna help you. What we're gonna do is help you manage those relationships with existing pharmacies or anybody who, who wants to increase their income. You can be you know, one of the core uh, resources that allows them to do that. So you will be a business within yourself. Yep. You'll have your own brand. We'll talk about marketing. You know, Just what we're doing now, LinkedIn Live, whether we have 10 viewers, 1,000 viewers or five viewers, it doesn't matter, we do it regularly. Um, you know, we do our live sessions because we get engagement. The only important thing about marketing is engagement, yep. not the views and the numbers. So these are things we talk about how we've developed our, our marketing strategy over the last you know, two years. Uh, so to- I mean, there used to be a time where I would pay to talk and now I'm paid to talk. Yes. So can, can you believe that? You know, that's just with the right strategy. I'm in, uh, you know, invited to various shows and I'm being paid to speak. So, you know, this is, this is it folks. We will take you on that journey from start in, to finish. In the last year and a half, I've publicly presented now to over 10,000 people. Yeah. Uh, I have been invited to a TEDx talk, which was last year in uh, the Sheldonian in Oxford. Uh, I have interviewed celebrities. I've worked with celebrities. I've, and again, it's not so much the, the kind of showing off that, oh, it's a celebrity. It's what you learn from these people and what you learn from them are they are not afraid to go out and talk about themselves in terms, in terms of the services. This is where I really feel we clinicians really lack. We, we, you know, we, we do great work, but we don't talk about it. We don't show it. We don't use video or, or content to really get a message off you know, out there. So this is gonna be one of the most essential parts to this program not just clinic, the clinical stuff, but also the kind of enterprise, business yeah. development and marketing. So six months worth of training, you have mentoring. So you can pick up the phone and speak to myself or one of the clinicians. You have help with your university course. We provide you with a DMP. So if you're not a prescriber, this is included in that. We provide you with a DMP. You will get to where I have in six months because what you're doing is you're not spending time reading the Gray's Anatomy or you know, Vanda's physiology and spending two years when you don't need that. You don't need that. For the scope of practice that we're gonna be prescribing and diagnosing and treating, you don't have to understand the structure on a microscopic level. You don't have to worry about histology. You don't have to worry about that nervous tissue has, you know, has dendrites, has, you know, has an axon and so forth. Yes, you'll, you'll have a very good understanding of it, but you don't need to worry about the, the, the histological features of, of the human body, you get from A to Z a lot quicker. You have that support. So it's weekly webinars, weekly quizzes, two, three day events face to face. You have written examinations, you have a portfolio. It's mapped against advanced clinical practice, evidence based. And we are also offering partnerships and teaching for those students who are looking to work with us and develop, develop these skills. We have seven students already who are starting in March and three students who are starting in, in the later on course. And we are actually developing a documentary. So keep an eye out for that as well. If you have your own networking, you have your own doctor, you can pick up the phone and speak to doctor, you just want your prescribing, then we do offer a purely DMP service. If you're not able to find a DMP who's willing to support you and you say, look, I've exhausted everything. I spoke to the doctors, no one's interested. We can support you with that. In that, what we do, we provide you with the DMP. We teach you clinical history, taking physical examination. Again, all this is already standard in the medical Mastery Program. 90 hours of supervision and university application and support. But that's on the basis that you, are, you have a support network. So there's two things that we can help you with there. In addition to that, we are also offering all our courses via a webinar. So... We've got face-to-face -face courses or via a webinar. 
So anatomy and physiology teaching, I'm starting the webinars hopefully this month or early next month. We're also already doing courses on physical examination and minor illnesses via webinar. So you don't have to attend a three-day class. It's all done via a webinar, normally a very small class size, normally not more than three to four students, but we teach you history taking, physical examination, minor illnesses, relevant anatomy and physiology at your time. And you have access to the videos and so forth. So if you're not able to come to Oxford for various reasons, we can teach it, you know, teach it over a webinar. So you still have access to the learning at your time convenient to you. It normally works out to about, you know, 10 to 15 hours, hours worth of learning. So we normally like to do three hours a week over five weeks. Again, if you're someone who feels, no, I can do more than that. You can do four hours a week over three, three weeks and so forth. But it means that the same learning can be taught over a webinar. So if you're not, if you're in Scotland somewhere or Wales and you can't attend, it can now be done face-to-face -face via a webinar. So that's our physical examination, clinical history, minor illness course. And I'm starting the anatomy and physiology courses very soon as well. But this is more in your time and in, 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 you know, more convenient and relevant for you. Right. Thank you for listening. We now have the Q&A. So I will now basically answer all these burning questions one by one. Right. So let's start right from the top. Okay, got, okay. Reasons for wanting, Kimberly, thank you. We answer Sadiqur, absolutely. So Sadiqur said, absolutely. Do clinical assessment skills first before IP. You can do a standalone module before or just the first year on clinical assessment skills from ACP. Make sure, so make sure that your course is accredited. Uh, please provide some examples of values a pharmacist, a crime DMP can provide to a doctor's surgery. I think we've touched on that already. Focus on medicines optimization. There's a good document by the RPS, have a look at that. Offering med reviews to your surgery, BP checks and so forth. Uh, how can a pharmacist specialize in a field and then prove this to the university that there is a this need? To do with the application. So this is to do with the application. Basically, if you wanted to do prescribing in hypertension, you're already taking blood pressure measurements. You're already following guidelines. The only thing that you're not doing is the prescribing side. So that's pretty straightforward. You don't have to justify to them how you've already got the learning and the knowledge. But if, you've, if you're struggling with that part of the application, just give me a shout and I can kind of explain to you how, how I did that. How did you manage your time? We've discussed that. 15, can you break down the cost? Okay, so it's, so it's 24 hours worth of learning. So it's 24 hours worth of learning. Uh, sorry, 24 days worth of learning at university where I went to that you had to attend. So 24 days at eight hours is 192 hours times 25 pound an hour, works out to 4,800 pound. And then you add in a locum for that, because obviously if, if I was going, I was kind of paid for my course and you have a locum to cover the hours, that works out to 9,600 pound. And then time that you would take out for your study, including that it worked out to about, I think it worked out about 12,000 pound, rounded off to 15. So it's already at 9,600 pounds without study time, books, and you know, also the extra time that I spent at, spent at uh, the surgery. Definitely you need to be prepared to sacrifice time. Yep, that's important. Follow on the IP application. Uh, it will definitely be worth it. Fine, let's leave q &A. Like for example, in the application form, when they ask how would, okay, how would you benefit patients with hypertension as they prescribe in community pharmacy and what governance do you have in place? So imagine you're a pharmacist prescriber in a community pharmacy and you have patients who you diagnose with hypertension and start them on treatment. Now in a community pharmacy is a bit tricky to, to be to be, you know, die, to be treating unless obviously you're not going to start someone I'm lodipine without doing a blood test and so forth, but you can. The point is that, Romain, what you want to understand is it's not about prescribing. Take a holistic approach. You have a patient who has the social prescribing. You have a patient who has hypertension. You identify that. You refer that to the doctor. Or you could, if you're within your setting and you had access to blood testing like I do and so forth, you could start treatment on hypertension. You could do that. Or you could start them on treatment, looking at their, looking at guidelines and focusing on their nutrition, which plays a huge part in, in hypertension. So 
again, get in touch with me. We can discuss that. But there, you know, there's already a national service that's going to be launched very soon, where they're focusing on pharmacy and cardiovascular, uh, card the cardiovascular system and preventing sort of you know cardiovascular events. So hypertension is a real big one, you know, and and it definitely you could run a clinic in a community pharmacy with the right training. There's nothing stopping you. What governance procedure would you have in place? So you would need an SOP. You would need to be trained appropriately. Ideally, it would be good if you can have your system actually merge with the GPs. So you want to engage with them. So that's important. Where do I teach? So I teach at MedLearn, uh, which is the training organization. And my videos can be found on YouTube. Is your course really £15,000 or is this a mistake? The course is 4995 That's correct. And which university is it accredited by? So that's gone into, there's, there's three universities at the moment that we are in discussions with. And between one of them, we'll be announcing that very soon, who we're actually partnering up with. Uh, one of them I'm really interested with, one of them I'm not so interested with. So that will be announced very soon. Uh, when is the latter involvement for the master class? How much does the master course cost? So the master course is 14995 we did do our first 10 students at 13,995. And the next enrollment is in September, but the one for March is, is now pretty much underway. But if you're interested, get in touch. It is starting on the 23rd of March is their first webinar taught by Dr. Akib, who's an AME consultant. How do you develop your clinical knowledge when working in community? Uh, how do you develop your clinical knowledge when working community? I work in community and what do you think of my clinical knowledge? I think, um, well, you, you obviously you, you spend a lot of time in the clinical knowledge. The question is essentially referring to in community. So I think the, the answer to that question is um, peer review, mentorship, uh, having the right networks in reviewing your work. Uh, to be honest, every single patient that work, walks through your pharmacy or in a pharmacy setting, you know, it's a massive opportunity to, to develop your clinical knowledge. You know, let me tell you how I started learning. Every time a doctor would prescribe something like phenoxymethylpenicillin. Yeah. So this is, so we're not talking about anatomy and physiology, folks. Put that aside. You need to know your theory. Yeah. You can't start treating diagnosing if you don't know how the body works. It's like you trying to work on a car, right? You don't understand the engine. You don't understand the parts. You can't start treating. But let me give you an example. Next time you have a patient who the GP prescribes for tonsillitis, do an examination of the oral cavity. You're gonna to start to learn. Next time the patient presents with clithromycin and he has a chest infection, listen to their chest. The next time a patient presents with ciprofloxacillin, ask them, was it a UTI? What were your symptoms? Most likely pilonephritis. It is so easy for you to learn in community pharmacy because you see patients. Talk to also what equipment they could use uh, you know, uh, whilst they're doing that, so they're examining all the patients. Yeah, so you, you really would need a otoscope. If you're unsure which one to buy, don't spend hundreds of pounds, get in touch. I'm happy to discuss that. A stethoscope. You need to have a blood pressure monitor, temperature, because vitals are so important, and, uh, you know, measuring the oxygen sats, so ox oximeter. That's, that's all you need. Sophia, can locus benefit from prescribers? Um, absolutely, because... Let me just give you some numbers. Um, if, if you have a general pharmacy and you look at the 10% is, is the net profit. So a pharmacy turning over, for example, 2.6 billion, they're looking at about 200K if it is 10% net. If you were to work with these pharmacies and say, guys, you know what, let me help you develop your service. Now, let me give you some numbers here. Uh, you know, you charge 20 pound a consultation, okay? Uh, in fact, I'll do the numbers now. 20 pound for consultation and, um, you know, they get uh, the prescription and the cost of uh, the private prescription, for example. Obviously, you could work out a model for them. I can tell you, um, yeah, so it's 10K, so I'll, I'll just give it you here. So an average, a consultation will average out to be about 30 pounds, okay? At six consultations per pharmacy, so we have two branches. So we average it, usually it's about 12 uh, that you would average it out at, okay? Uh, four weeks, that's about, uh, uh, sorry, one second, 12 times 30 times seven. So that's £2,500 a week. You multiply that by four, that's about 10000 in a year, just over 100 k So if you if you do a turnover around £145,000, your net is probably around um, 
uh, that that's kind of what we worked it out to be. So, but as I said, if it's a pharmacy doing dispensing items with retail, 2.6 million and the turnover net profit is about, uh, no, it's, it's uh, would you use, no, the, we, we were doing purely private, ours is private based. It's not NHS based at all. So I'm, I'm regularly seeing around anything between 15 to 20 patients on a daily basis who walk into our pharmacy that I'm treating. And we charge now 25 to 30 pounds for the consultation. We started with 10, then we jumped up to 20. And now uh, also the kind of practitioners, by the way, this is the other advantage of what Fahim is saying, even if you're not prescribing. Uh, in fact, there's another lady who's doing it really well in her pharmacy in Scotland. Um, Bernadette. Bernadette. Uh, they are fully booked for consultations. Like if you look at their diary, they are fully booked for consultations uh, and they are using NHS services, obviously, but also private services. People are happy to pay the pharmacist for specialist advice. Yep. It could be nutrition. It could be a number of things, uh, you know, and you travel clinics, whatever. But people are happy to pay and walk away without a prescription. Not everybody. This is the most important thing that, you know, we try to mention, get across. The whole point of non-medical prescribing is developing your clinical skills. It's not necessary for you to become That's a prescription right. popper. Yeah. So, you know, I, I normally see 15 patients a day at 30 pounds, excluding the obviously, you know, downstairs, they'd go to the pharmacy, 30 pound. So that works out to about 10,800 pound a month on just my prescribing. Uh, and so I'll get to that in a second. So that's kind of how that works. That doesn't include my Botox and filler work as well. Well, see, mentioned that we started charging initially 10 pounds. Yes, we initially started 10 pounds. That was because at that time, I was gaining my skills and gaining my quality, you know, gaining my competencies. What you don't want to do is, is start treating patients and they end up in hospital and they come back to you saying your diagnosis was wrong. So, you know, I didn't want to start doing things for free, but I kept a price that was reasonable. And then you start developing a reputation. Once you start developing that reputation locally, think about it, whatever you're in a pharmacy right now, imagine there was a pharmacy where you could walk into and be seen and diagnosed for commonly seen minor, minor conditions. Would you pay 20, 25 quid if you could be seen then and there diagnosed and treated? Classic example, um, you know, if, if someone walks in with chlorophenicol with their child who's under two years old, it's not licensed to be sold to that child. And now they have to go and book an appointment and wait to be seen by a GP or get a phone consultation. Believe me, we have two pharmacies in different areas. And one you could compare to a lot of places where you would think no one was going to pay at that point. And then another one where people would. <laughs> the place where you would think they're not willing to pay, people are willing to pay. People will value and pay for a service that you yourself value and believe in, right? So a lot of your barriers that are coming to you in terms of, you know, why would someone pay 30 pound or 20 pound? Not everybody will, but I could guarantee you'll have enough people doing it to make it not just worth your while, but also the partnership if, if you don't own a pharmacy if you're working with uh, a unit for example but will people expect to pay i touched on it do your due diligence ask your patients yeah. i used to think exactly the same thing why do, would people do pay research. do do an just every time you know i did we, we did it for about a month yeah we did a q a not q a it was a uh, what's it called questionnaire do a questionnaire even you know when we first started pharmacy we go back we we stopped this brand right there's a very expensive brand called New Chapter. And this brand, one of the vitamins, uh, sorry, mushrooms, reishi was 60 pound for a box of a uh, packet of 30, right? Yep. I, and the reason why I bring this example is the, the issues we as pharmacists have. Me and Fahim did not sell it for six months. So it's, no one's going to buy it. <laughs> because we didn't believe that anybody's going to buy it. Once uh, we had a patient who walked in and happened to know about it and we fluke it was pure fluke we knew what it did and, and we knew the knowledge behind it but we were just too afraid to sell pure fluke we sold when this person bought this product and walked away we had a change in mindset we thought wait a minute absolutely why, why i mean i happen? i was told don't judge the lottery ticket holder yeah stop anyone don't judge ask your patients if after you've done a survey, you turn around and say to me, oh, look, they're not willing to pay, I'll believe it. But otherwise, I'm just not prepared to believe it. I've done the research. You know, people, the private market is worth billions. Just do your research. I'm with the private. Why do people go to Harley Street? 
know, why do people go to, believe me, just, just start doing your research. You'll find out people are more than happy to pay. From 30 pound hammock, do you as a pharmacist keep? I have my own clinic. So I don't really work in the pharmacy, but what I do give the pharmacy is the prescriptions and they keep the money from the prescriptions. But if you were going to be working with a pharmacy, I think you know you should be doing it maybe 50-50, if not slightly more, but I wouldn't do any less than that. Ultimately, you're making the decision, you'll make the diagnosis. The smart way to do it would be well, to partnership up with pharmacies and say, look, I'll run a clinic for you and let's do, a, let's do an arrangement. You keep them just like these online telemedicines do it. How do they do it? They give you the iPad and they said you get the money they for the scripts. They, they keep the consultation fee themselves. Keep the consultation fee, but the advantage that you have is you're promoting pharmacy. Yes. Keep that in mind. That's the key. You're promoting pharmacy. You're promoting our profession. We don't have other healthcare professionals. As, as, as an employer, if you're thinking, oh, but if I uh, partner with a pharmacist, they don't really work for me. Don't think about it like that. I'll tell you why. If you just put a device and, and ultimately that, you know, if you just put a device there, right? It's about that device. It's not necessarily about your team and what you guys do. The pharmacist who locums for you and helps you do this service when your patient walks in, he's still walking into X physical building, Y physical building. They are forming an emotional connection with that place, not just the prescriber, right? So yeah. it already gives you value. Imagine, Sophie, if you were a you were aesthetics practitioner and you went to a pharmacy and said, let me set up a clinic. They, they're not going to say no to you. Imagine you're a prescriber and said, look, I want to, you know, how many consultation rooms have we seen in pharmacies that are just, doing nothing nothing would they not be happy if you started if they started you know if you started generating income they would be one of my uh, in, uh one of our uh, colleagues who works with us she has given us a proposal about what she'd like to do in the pharmacy and i've said fair enough why not you keep half i keep half i've got no problem so if you come up with a business case any pharmacy would be happy to do it and this is why again you know pharmacists you are an amazing profession you know we have a very specific group of skills uh, compared to all the professions. You know, we're brilliant tech partners. We can join IT companies and there's a lot of pharmacies and startups that are raising millions with pharmacist products. We're clinicians. We have leadership skills. You're always leading teams. You're training your teams all the time. You're watching your cash flows. You know, you, you're the fully whole, like whole rounded individual. So M has asked, what's the best way to further develop your prescribing competencies after focusing on, for example, hypertension? Right, so the answer to that is, it's just like when you learn to drive, right? How do you start off by driving on the small roads and then you get onto the motorway? Same thing, you start off with hypertension. Once you've done your hypertension, you say, okay, now I'm gonna start focusing on minor illnesses. You'll pick a minor illness, so let's start doing on ENT. So you'll obviously know the relevant anatomy, you'll know the physiology, you know the pathophysiology, you'll have a support network and you'll start seeing and treating. The first time maybe it'll be a doctor who'll show you, you can look, have a look at these signs and symptoms. That's what tonsillitis looks like. Maybe you'll see it for the second time. The third time you'll do, you know, you'll, you'll treat, you'll maybe show the doctor or your colleague, what do you think? They'll say, yep. And then you'll, you'll prescribe. The same patient comes again and slowly you start to develop. How do you know you're competent at something? That has nothing to do with you. A qualification doesn't mean you're competent. To show that you're competent is evidence, right? I am treating so many patients in Oxford. I have a list of evidence that I have that I can show that these people have been treated. You can go on my, you know, you can go on my uh, our our page on Amy's and have a look at the, at the at the reviews under Amy's clinic. So it's not Amy's pharmacy under Amy's clinic. You can have a look at the reviews there. That's evidence. You can have a look at. I get all my patients to give us a review on our website and write a review, you know, on various different platforms. I have my, you know, every time a patient comes back and goes, it's work, that's competency, I'm doing it right. You know, ultimately, if you have an understanding of your, how the human body works, you've seen it, that's how you become competent, it's through practice. No one can stop you from prescribing in an area that you feel you're competent in. The only time that you're gonna get questioned is when you have gone and done something that you were not competent in, because you didn't have the training, you didn't have the mentoring, then you're in trouble. If you decided tomorrow as a prescriber to start prescribing in you know, some sort of cancer and you had your, no learning, I don't think legally anybody can stop you. But when something goes wrong, 
that's when you get in trouble. But imagine you were in a, in a cancer ward for six months, you were seeing patients, you were being mentored by a doctor, you were being shadowed by them, or you've done like the Medland Master Program where we develop your competencies, you have access to your portfolios. You will show that someone say, one second, look at all these cases that I've seen. You know, how does a doctor go from a registrar to a consultant? Same thing, look at all the cases I've seen. You will be signed off for those conditions and then you can say, there you go. And we only sign you off once you pass the examination. That's how I would say, okay, yeah, you know, uh, Sophia or M or, you know, Ali or Ruman is competent because they've done X, Y, Z. You know, you will be writing out on the mastery program, all the cases, patient, 30 year old patient presented with a cough. This was the diagnosis. This was the treatment. This was the follow-up. This is what I found. Imagine you've got a whole caseload of them. Why would, how could anybody question you? So that's basically kind of the gist of it. Get in touch, get advice. You know, if you want to get from A to Z a lot quicker and you want to learn how to benefit financially, develop your prescribing skills, get in touch with MedLearn. We can do it for you on the 20th of April. We're going to be there. I'm also talking, I've been invited kindly to talk at the pharmacy show as well. We're working quite closely with various other, you know, NHS bodies. So, you know, keep an eye on what's happening here, Health Education England and so forth. So very, very excited. So it's going to be good times. Uh, anybody have any questions? How do you contact me after the webinar? That's a good question. Um, Let me give you my number. LinkedIn or, yep, you've got Fahim's number there. There you go. Uh, but otherwise... I need to stop doing that. I need to stop just giving yeah, out my number. Yeah, <laughs> I need to just stop giving out my number, uh, you know. But I have no trouble you, for Kate. that. Um, yeah, so yeah, reach out on LinkedIn. Uh, you know, we're always available messaging there. Fahim's always handing out his number, so he's available there. Uh, but the point is... You know, the, the sorry, the, the, the advantage of... Uh, yes, we do have a WhatsApp group. We do have a WhatsApp group for those people on our MedLearn. That's right. The advantage of social media is you can vet someone out so quick. It is so easy to vet someone out now. Just go and look at their LinkedIn. Go and look at their Facebook. You can vet them out. It's so straightforward. But you can follow me on LinkedIn. There's my number, get in touch. Uh, what type of CPDs are recommended to include in an application? So just your, uh, Anissa, just your general CPD is fine for you to do, whatever, you know, training you've done. You know, let's say you've read an article on, uh, I don't know, let's say you've done an article on, on, you know, I will regularly write CPDs and stuff like this. You know, I've, I've read the Bates book, I've read XYZ, I've, I've, put, an, I've put an article on that. Uh, so, you know, that, CPD could be anything, it's just continued professional development. Could be article that you read, could be networking that you've done, could be an event that you've attended. You could write a CPD today on what we've just discussed today. You could identify learning outcomes from here. You could say, I want to develop my learning skills and you can do that. So that could also be a CPD. Do you have a WhatsApp group? Yes, part of the Medlin program. You mentioned before the Medlin course is equivalent to a diploma. Yes, so diplomas are normally 369 hours worth of work. So any course that is more than that is technically a diploma. Uh, is the course equal to advanced clinical practice? So to become an advanced clinical practitioner, you need to have a master's level degree, which you have. You need to be an independent prescriber, which you will be. And then it's a case of you mapping yourself against the relevant standards. And then that being recognized by university. That's why, as I mentioned, we're working with two to three universities and one of them we're gonna pick. And that's how we'll map you against that. Advanced clinical practice is normally three years because it requires you to also do uh, various areas on research and so forth. But if you can map yourself, which is what we're doing with our students, then you, there's a lot of modules that you don't have to retake. But at the moment, as it stands, if, if you map, it's quite easy to map yourself against advanced clinical practice if you're following these pathways. But to be classed an advanced clinical practitioner at the moment, it's not regulated, but when it does, we'll have more clear guidance. But ultimately, you know, how I see it, I wanna use my prescribing qualifications to help patients and benefit financially. I don't really want to be spending three years at university, even if it's doing medicine, because it just doesn't fit my kind of agenda. But if it's something that you want to do, you can go to university, spend two years or three years. Ultimately, you want to make sure whatever you're doing, you're benefiting financially and it's hands-on. What we give you access to is hands-on patients, hands-on case studies, mentoring, support, and we guarantee at the end of it, that you will be safely diagnosing and prescribing for this condition, hands down, as long as you pass the assessments. And um, 
anybody else have any questions before we go? And thank you. You know what we've done? It. It's been my sessions are always. I, I, I do LinkedIn live sessions and then never gets wrong, but this is this is the uh, coronavirus. Everyone, just be safe and look after yourself. I think um, the other thing we're going to be doing a LinkedIn live session with Mike and Paul, hopefully on Monday. I will share the details, specifically talking about now that you mentioned it. Um, you know where pharmacy stands. Again, all of you are watching, and if you are uh, associated with pharmacy or pharmacists, uh, we we you know what we should be using Twitter. You know, I don't. I'm not I, a fan I, of Twitter. I, I've used Twitter. LinkedIn is I don't like. Know. I think LinkedIn um, is. In fact, I've probably had more views on Facebook. I think one of our videos videos I did had over 200,000 views, a lot of engagement, but Twitter is something we should be engaged with. I mean, Tohey Dool and Sadiq are always telling me Twitter, 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 Twitter. He's right. But, That's something we should uh, be doing. But I am, yeah, I'm not. On, it's, 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 I am on Twitter, but I'm not that active on yeah, Twitter. Yeah, but you should be because all the political uh, policy makers are on Twitter. Um, but again, coming back to this, I really feel that all of you need to share your journeys and stories. If there's one thing you do, coming out of it, regardless of whether you join us or not, is you must go and talk about what you do on a daily basis. The profession needs it. And I, as I said, I've not talked about the coronavirus for a specific reason, because I felt that it's something that's happening to us today. A lot of people are being affected. So the way I've gone about the conversation, if I have even talked about it, is more related to what pharmacy can do to help out, because this is my issue. Every politician, Every policymaker talks about our NHS, our doctors and our nurses, which is great. But I want to see the word pharmacy and pharmacist mentioned on there. Yeah. So if anything, share your stories, do it on your own platforms, build your personal brands by doing that. Because just in these next few weeks, we are going to be sharing videos of what we're doing in our pharmacy, how we're supporting our community, not to take essentially advantage of the situation, but more so to prove to the government, listen, you did those cuts, but this would have been the benefit if you hadn't. This is what we could have done for the country today. And to be honest, this is what we will be doing to, for the country today. Just give you examples, free deliveries, we're not paid for them, right? But we've got lots of surgeries ringing us, could you please deliver to this patient? Could you please deliver to that patient? Yep. There's risk, you know, these are the things we're gonna be talking about. Shout out to Sadiqo Tahidul for the Pharmacist Cooperative. Check them out. You know, again, do have a very similar, again, working with like-minded people. The reason that we get along, we have a very similar vision and that is to upskill our profession, help our profession. So again, great stuff there. Uh, you know, check them out as well. 20th of April, I'm going to be there talking for aesthetics. Anybody who wants to develop aesthetic competencies, get in touch. We've got Dr. Camille, a plastic surgeon who teaches on the course as well. You know. Non-medical prescribing, and if you want to benefit financially, it's, a, it's an amazing opportunity. And now's the time to invest in yourself for life. Invest in yourself, make a difference to your lives, make a difference to the life of the others, benefit financially, distribute that wealth, but invest in this chip right here. You know, you've got the latest phone, you've got the latest gadget, don't forget to invest in your knowledge. That's what separates you from everybody else. So, you know, if you want more information about the Midland Mastery Program, watch my videos on YouTube. There's a, my anatomy lectures are there. You can watch them, you know, sign up to the YouTube uh, Medlin page and God bless you all. Thank you for all your support. And thanks for God for giving us this opportunity and have a wonderful evening and a good weekend. Thank you. Thank you guys. Have a wonderful evening and uh, stay safe and good luck and share your stories. Good night. Good night. Let's just uh, unmute you. It's not in the... Should we stop share first? Oh, there you go.